Welcome, Alexis, Kate, Kelly. Welcome. Hi. Okay. Oh my gosh, my little, a little messed up up here. William is now obsessed with salt lamps. So, um, he moves around cool. everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't believe he's strong enough to hold that. Oh, he is so strong. <laughs> Everyone, we're giving um, our friends just a few more minutes to join us, and then we'll get started. Welcome. Thanks for making space midday. Last night, I came home, and Victoria had hung a bunch of her artwork. You know, she loves masking tape, so there were probably like 10 pieces of art, her art on the wall. All yeah. Really well. And then this morning I hear him going, Wah! and he pulled down all of the artwork. Just oh no, was she okay with that? No, no, it led to a lot of other <laughs> interactions, we'll say. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Welcome. We've got more people joining us. Now 12.01, coming in. Fantastic. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you so much for being here. Shelby and I are both really excited to share with y'all today. And this is part a, of a uh, new element of programming that we want to share. We're going to um, be sharing deeper study. So what's beyond the asana as we all grow our own practices together and as we grow our practices collectively. So today we want to have a conversation about the eight limb path of yoga and how to apply it to your life today. So before we get started, I just want to mention a couple of things. If you haven't already signed up for the Be Free Digital Studio, make sure you do that. Your first week is free. You can join us both for classes all throughout the week, as well as an expansive digital library of um, classes that we've already recorded, including tutorials. Additionally, we'll be launching in three short weeks our new online eight-week program called Empowered. If you're looking to deepen your physical yoga practice and learn more about what we're sharing today and how you can start applying the practice to your life, your relationships, your nutrition, uh, all aspects of life, um, this is what we're exploring, as well as going deep, deep, deep into asana too, okay? all of it together. So, Shelb, as we get started, do you just want to um, take us into a quick grounding meditation? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Mm -hmm. Let's take one clearing breath now, please, all together. Inhale. Open your mouth and exhale. Close your eyes and find a good posture, a posture that gives you some engagement and a little bit of enthusiasm to be present with us today, but also some softness to relax. Feel the seat beneath you, steady and stable. Through your nose, take a slow, deep inhale. Open your mouth and sigh out. Breath in. Breath out. One more all together, inhale. 
and then exhale. Arrive in your body in a space of listening, in a space of inquiry, and steady and stable. May this practice, this meditation, benefit the well-being of all of us. Breath in and breath out. Blossom your eyes open and slowly lift your chin. Thank you, Shelby. Thank you, Leah. All right, now we're grounded. Okay, so a couple of just housekeeping notes. We have the chat function, and thank you, Alexis, for your, um, uh, your note there. Um, we're excited for this too. If you have any questions as they arise during our discussion, please plug them into the chat, and we'll save some time at the end of this conversation for your questions about the Elam path, about the practice, or you can really ask us anything. Um, we're here for you. So um, we'll go through each of the different limbs and a little bit about the eight limb path. And as we explore the limbs together, we're going to use the lens that the lenses that we use in the empowered program to study the practice. So we're going to look at what does this mean for us on the mat? What does it look like physically? And then as we look to the teachings and all of the eight limb path is within the yoga sutras. So we're really going to be looking at, well, how is it laid out in the yoga sutras? What is the philosophical lens? And then the practical lens. How do we put this into practice in our lives today? Like our modern day, 2020, eight months into a global pandemic, how do we live <laughs> the yoga practice today? Because to be honest, there are a lot of shifts. We are all dealing with extraordinary changes and challenges for life today, which makes yoga so potent and powerful when we direct our attention to these ancient and timeless practices and weave them in with purpose, with persistence, and with skill today. So what do you, what do you have to say about that? You know, all I have to say is that, um, is that now is the time that we can use our yoga in such a powerful way. And I don't think any of us ever anticipated a 2020 to happen like it has for, for us, you know, globally um, and in our nation and in our local communities as well. Everything that we've been going through, mm -hmm. through the pandemic and also social justice and everything that this year has brought. And when I started yoga, I needed tools to... Um, to monitor my life, mm -hmm. to go through my early 20s when I was a wild, crazy child. I mean, I was wild. And yoga brought me some parameters, particularly the yamas and the niyamas, some parameters. And they became tools for me mm -hmm. to be able to access conflict, hard decisions, whatever. And um, throughout these last eight months, especially in isolation and trying to be connected to everybody, I've held on to my to this practice of yoga in such a deeper, more reverent way than I kind of ever thought. I thought I already had done that, but it really come to uplift me and my well-being and help me connect to others, even through the highs and the lows. Mm -hmm. It's like been a steady thing always. And that's what it gives us. And it's super simple to follow once you get in. What you just said reminded me of the conversation we were having yesterday, setting our intentions and using our practice of our practices of yoga are not only for when life is super easy, right? In fact, we want to be doing these practices so that when we hit challenges or turbulence or uncertain times, we are not left with just our survival mechanisms, right? right. We have tools and we have studied ourselves, studied um, how other people have thrived, how, um, how we can live with more purpose and, and power really even when life is super, super challenging. 
Yeah, that's why yeah, we- it's just the pathway. It's the roadmap for us so that because we're always going to step off to the side or fall off kilter at times. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you don't have to do it all day, every day, but you've got this roadmap so that when you do fall off, you have a place to come back to and it anchors you and keeps you going forward so that you can be in that state of that flow state of life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that is safe. You know, that gives you a place of security and an anchor mm-hmm. and, um, we need that more than ever right now. Yes. And I would even say that when you look to the eight limbs, it helps you to work it all day, every day. Yeah. Right? Because the more you practice, the more momentum you have going and the more it becomes not just on the mat, but it becomes the other 23 or 22 hours for the rest of the day. You're living your practice rather than just doing your asana. Yeah. So let's dive in. Let's okay. take a look at the, the eight limbs of yoga. So we're gonna reference my book. This is the main manual for the Empowered program and for the 200 hour teacher training we do. Um, <laughs> Look we at all have, of our posters. Yeah. And I've spilled on this book a couple of times. We're, um, we outline or I outline all of the eight limbs in the introduction because this is the foundation for a yoga practice. Okay? This is the, the ways of living that will enhance everything that we're doing on the mat. So if you go to the introduction of my book, there's a few pages on the eight limbs of yoga. Let's go through each of them. The first limb is the yamas. The second limb is the niyamas, and these go together. We could do a whole webinar on just a few of those, so, but we'll do broad strokes today. Third limb is asana, the yoga practice that we do on the mat. Then we've got pranayama, breath, or energy control. Then the next four limbs are levels of meditation. And this is where the, we start to get more depth and richness um, in, the, in the practice. And so those are pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. Okay? So we'll go through all of those in more detail. If you have any questions as we are talking about these, shoot them into the chat. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, Shelby, straight from the heart. Okay, so let's take a look at the yamas. I'm gonna read from the book and then we'll discuss. So the yamas are the restraints. The first yama is ahimsa, or non-harming. The second yama is satya, or truthfulness, honesty sometimes it's translated as. Third is asteya, non-stealing. Fourth is brahmacharya, moderation. And then fifth is aparigraha, non-possessiveness. So the yamas and the niyamas work together. They are often called like the 10 commandments of yoga or the do's and the do nots of yoga. And the yamas are how we as individuals are relating to the world around us. It's like the, the code for how we are interacting with the world and the people and other people. The niyamas are more about the personal observances and how you are behaving, what you are up to when no one else is looking, when it's just you. So we've got the outer practices and the inner practices all within these first two limbs, the yamas and the niyamas. Do you wanna go through each of these, Shel? I do. I'd like to add something before we dive into those. Um, I just have always loved that yoga means union to join together, to come together. And in that, that's the collective, right? We have to understand ourselves so that we can be with the collective. But what I love about the yamas and the niyamas is that although they go together, yamas is first. And that's the observances and how you take care of the world around you. So our first action, our first ethical code of conduct of how we live our life is to make sure that we take care of the world around us and and how we do that. By, way, by the way that we take care of ourselves as well. And I just find that so beautiful because it's not I first, it's not save me or do this for me, it's how do I hold the space for the world around me? And what do I vow to do with the world around me? Mm-hmm. And um, I just find that to be a really beautiful offering from the start of this is everything. I mean, the eight limb path is why we do yoga. And it's the foundation of the whole system. And for it to start with how we hold space for the world around us is beautiful to me. 
And I would say how we interact with the world around how us. How we interact with the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And that Patanjali, the study of yoga says that in order to live an, a, um, or an ethical life, in order to reach states of optimum health and happiness, we first do no harm. We don't steal. We tell the truth, right? We're not grasping onto anything. We're not yeah. hoarding, right? We, we approach this life with humility, right? With a balance and looking for the greater good rather than just what's good for me. Right. It's so good. The first part of how to have an optimal life. Yes, yes. And the first yama is ahimsa, do no harm, non-harming. And I guess when I first started practicing yoga, I took this quite literally and went, and I was a vegetarian for 13 years, so I didn't eat any meat. I did my stints with raw veganism. Um, and, and oftentimes it's, it's translated in like pretty strictly for some yogis, but how do we look at it for modern life? How do you see Ahimsa coming into daily life as studio owner, as Shelby, as someone living in 2020? Yeah. Um, well, for me, like in the most present moment, this past few weeks, even mm -hmm. I, I have had some really self-sabotaging thoughts at times, right? This like inner voice, inner talk of why I'm not good enough at anything. And then it kind of like comes out sideways to people that are really close to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and there's times when it doesn't, but I'm working on that. And I have to remind myself all the time. It's be kind to yourself so that you can be kind to others. Be kind to others so that you can be kind to yourself, even in just the language that I'm speaking with people. Yes, I eat meat, but I'm not going out and hurting people physically or animals around me. My really work, my work this, in this really present moment is around the language that I'm keeping within myself and the way I'm putting it out to others. And I slip up every day. And just recognizing that, what is my intention with my language? How do I want to talk to myself? How do I really want to be with somebody else that I cherish, that I love? Mm -hmm. And um, the constant reminder of like, use your voice, use your words with the intention of non-harm. That's how I'm working with it presently in my life. Oh yeah, that's a good one. So that's something that we can manage all the time. That can be an extension of our practice. Every time we are noticing our inner dialogue, right? And when we are having a conversation with someone else, is my speech creating greater connection or am I doing harm? And when I do harm, how can I clean that up and reestablish yeah. the connection? And when you notice it, when you have the pillar of ahimsa as your intention, and then you get to see how far away you've strayed from it. If that's not there, if you're not even um, keeping that in your, in your vision, then you don't notice how far you've trailed away. Mm -hmm. But to always come back to that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, um, and also it gets you the opportunity to understand why you're having those reactions or why are you having those feelings and why are they coming out of your mouth? Mm -hmm. You know, And it just keeps getting, the opportunity is there for you to see yourself more deeply mm -hmm. from that one place. It becomes an opportunity for self-reflection or self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. So we have a question about Ahimsa. Can we talk about the A in Ahimsa? So not being the lack of harm, but the opposite of harm? I don't totally understand that question. Can we talk about the A in Ahimsa? Which A? So not being the lack of so harm. It's non-harming. I don't know. Alexis, can you deepen that question for us? So these are the, the do nots, essentially, of the the eight limbs, the yamas are, so I will not harm. So in all actions, you are seeking unity, coming together and not avoiding harm, but taking action to create the greater good. So I've heard that it's not only not harming, but the opposite, it's the opposite of harming, right? So it is actually seeking union and seeking to expand and grow together. Um, and I totally hear Alexis and I feel you and I have looked through that lens on all of the yamas and yamas as well 
Um, so we're taking it quite literally from the tradition of non-harming. And in the applicable modern way that we teach yoga to people every day, especially in the essence and intention of language, there is a, there is a way to look at everything from like a positive or affirming vocabulary rather than the quite literal non-harming. Right. So if it's not harming, is it protective? Like what is the opposite of harm is to support, to love, to cherish, you know, you can look at it both ways, but we are I'm definitely not sure. nurture. Yeah. That's a great one. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so both, right? Like how do you want to use your language and also where do we come from? Like the tradition is to say non-harming and then we can apply that to an adaptation of nurture. And seeing both for what they are individually and then together is really awareness, mm -hmm. right? Coming together. One way as we extend this with food and we look at nurture versus harm, right? And as a modern yogi, how I applied that is how I'm feeding my family, right? How am I nurturing their cells and getting them the most nutrition and helping them grow versus letting it be automatic and quick and just another check on my to-do list. Like how can I pour myself, my vital life force energy into how I am contributing to the health of my family? Mm -hmm. That's like a modern applicable way. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's go on to the next one, Satya, truthfulness. So um, Satya is being honest with yourself and staying true to yourself in your thoughts, speech, actions, and relationship. This goes beyond simply not telling lies. Telling the truth is a pathway to freedom. So I heard recently, and this is not unique, but it had me thinking about this conversation, that when you tell the truth, you don't have to remember your lies. So it, it is just an honest way to be in the world, to interact with the world. And then when you're not having to remember what you've built up or covered up, right? And you're just being truthful and honest, that's where you have the power of now, where you can be in your full presence, be in a union with the now moment. And that is living your yoga, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Satya, truthfulness for me. One of the things that I always ask myself is, is this true? What am I about to say? You know, and I am a very dramatic person. <laughs> And I've been dramatic since I was a little kid, very boisterous. And when there's 10 things in front of me, I say there's 30 things in front of me. And so applying Satya in my life has really got me to see, oh my gosh, when am I being dramatic? Is it being performative? Am I just being my personality out loud? How do I want to um, show up for the people with me? Is this a moment for me to recognize that actually being really clear about what I mean and delivering that? is the important practice. Mm -hmm. um, but so I went through a little bit of like a, a shame spiral early on in my yoga practice of Satya because I realized how, how wild I am, right? And I let like very dramatic things, mm -hmm. descriptions, whatever, and I'm um, boisterous. And it kind of dials me back a little bit. I mean, not kind of, it dials me back a little bit and I'm still a little wild. <laughs> so rather than going for like, how big can we go? It's what's most true in this moment. Yeah. This really comes into play on the mat, right? When yeah. you are going through transitions, it's like, well, how can I create that balance of effort and ease to harness my vital energy versus going for the gold in all the poses? Or, I don't know. Uh, you mentioned performative, too. Yeah, yeah. That's so when you said on the mat, I didn't mean to cut you off, but when you said on the mat, the first thing I thought, not necessarily a transition, but I thought about Gonda Barandasana. Me too. Okay. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, if no one, if, if anyone on here doesn't know what Gonda Barandasana is, it's formidable face pose. Look at my, ah. um, <laughs> but it's when you stand on your chin and your legs come up above you mm -hmm. and then your toes touch your head. So back when I was like a young, flexible yogi, um, I would just go above and beyond to make that happen crank my low back and I was like trying to get it all the way over there without doing the process of getting there. Mm -hmm. And so talking about truthfulness on your mat, like what are you striving for in this? Is this honestly good for you right now? 
Are you doing it to, you know, sometimes you have to shoot your aim too far so you can figure out where your balance point is, right? But, um, but I see that all the time. And I would lie to myself and be like, oh yeah, I'm a backbender. Well, I wasn't a smart backbender back then. I wasn't doing it honestly for the safety and security and nurturement of my body. And contribution, you said a moment ago when we were talking about ahimsa, mm -hmm. right? All of this, in the end, when you ask yourself, truthfulness, is my truth contributing to the well-being of myself and the people around me? Mm -hmm. Right? And like, so is me going crazy in my transitions or my backgrounds or whatever, contributing to the well-being of me and the people around me? Um, and it's that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and then what's the energy you carry from your practice? Uh-huh. When, when uh, you mentioned that pose, I remember there was one time where I was trying to put it in all my vinyasas and I actually came off, I, I had a scrape on my chin. Dude, I had a rug burn. Oh, yeah. And, all, and so like, I, that's not serving. That's no, not, no, no. It was like 2010 ish. Okay, let's move on. We got, we got deep into that one. <laughs> We're all working around with rug burns. It was really funny. <laughs> okay, Estea, non stealing. Estea is not taking credit uh, or not taking or not taking credit for what is not ours and not longing for what others have. This principle reminds us to be mindful of our actions so that we're not taken away from ourselves, others, or the planet. Mm, okay, so this one to me, that last part, not taking from the planet right now, this for me is how to live in more alignment with the greater good, how to be a contributor to this earth, to our community, and to set up my children in a world where they can thrive versus just taking what's convenient um, and habitual today. It's bringing a mindfulness so that they are left in a better place. Yeah. I think about this one a lot because I'm always considering ways that I can conserve the planet better. Mm -hmm. um, really, last night when I was watching the debate, actually, I thought to myself, if there are two things, and when I was watching you on the Colorado Yogi's Forum two nights previous, I thought if there are two things that I'm ever going to look towards, look towards the light for, it's yeah. the planet and our children, right? Because that's like what's going to be everlasting. Um, and we take so much from our planet just to like source some kind of fuel that we need to get us some convenient thing that we have to have today. Quick, yeah, quick. Yes. Yeah. And um, so I like to add that little piece to it. Is, is, is this like a quick fix and convenience for me because I don't want to be put out? Or, you know, am I taking so that I can be taken care of right now? And how is that, how is that um, affecting anything else around me, the planet around me, the people around me? Mm -hmm. um, this one's hard, you know, because it, sometimes it feels like there's nothing that you can really do. I mean, obviously, I'm not stealing money from somebody. Mm -hmm. So that's that's like not even in my life, right? So it's non-stealing from our planet, from our people, from time of our people. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big one. So one, one way as we look at how does this come into life today, it's respecting um, boundaries, right? And respecting agreements with people. One that I'm always working on, and I know this is Astea, my practice of Astea is not being late because I'm actually stealing from other people's time. Yeah. And I'm struggling at it right now as a mother with two, but I keep a stay at in the forefront of my mind because it's not, when I'm running behind, I am actually taking from other people's life. You know what you're really good at though? You actually teach a 60 minute class. People are out the door in 60 minutes. And that is something that all yoga teachers should be conscious of, right? Talking about taking time. Because you're stealing from your students. I know. You got to start on time. You got to end on time. Um, Alexis says, because I have everything I need within. I love that. Yes. Like there's no need to take mm -hmm. from anybody or anything else because you already have what you need. Mm -hmm. That goes into the non-possessiveness um, as well. When we get to Aparigraha, it's the last one. But that's the lens that I look at that, Alexis. Um, I got them, she got that from a Lululemon bag, LOL. That is so funny. Yay, Lululemon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that does work here with non-stealing, but I think it's also a lot more in alignment with a Parigraha, which we're getting to. Okay, 
So let's look um, at Brahmacharya, Brahmacharya first, moderation, and then we'll go into Aparigraha. So Brahmacharya, there's power in moderation. Traditionally, Brahmacharya was described as celibacy through abstinence. You could preserve your um, life force energy, preserve and focus. A more modern approach is to be responsible and moderate in how, where, and with whom you spend your energy. For me, this looks like not binging, not binging on anything. I am wired up to be a pleasure seeker. I know that about myself. I like, when I like something, I go all in, which can actually turn into something that's depleting very, very quickly because you are binding your power to something outside of yourself. I'm binding my power, right? So being in a pleasurable experience with the world without taking it to the extreme, enjoying everything that the modern world has to offer, but not going too far, right? Taking mm -hmm. just enough. I like that, taking just enough. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one thing that we have in common, we have a lot of things in common, but we've always really connected on pleasure seeking, like extremes, whether it's juice cleanses or Saturday nights, live music, you know, like whatever it is, we do really enjoy um, sensation and experience and living in the full flavor and passion that life offers. Um, also connection with people. And it's like, once you get a little taste of that, you know, like all of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, one thing about brahmacharya for me, in order for me to stay in moderation and like stay on path of that, I have to kind of tell myself that when I take just enough or just what I need, I actually get to feel, to feel a, um, that sense of satiation and satisfaction mm -hmm. that it's not, because you know, when you go too far in one direction, you, you can tell that. In the moment, it feels great, but the aftermath of that is terrible, right? Yeah, there's so much cleanup when there's a, like some sort of binge involved, whether it's a Netflix binge, food, whatever. Right. So when you go through the binge state, the moment feels amazing, but then aftermath is really terrible recovery. And when you take just enough, in the moment, you feel like maybe that wasn't enough, but the aftermath is satisfaction actually and like wholeness and fulfillment and so i always had to tell myself that i'm like if i don't go too far i'm going to feel a lot better mm -hmm. and i'm going to remember that power and then it gives you a sense of power also you've like contained some energy because you haven't exasperated all of it and you're like, still in your center yeah you're, you're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this is living with the principles versus needing the principles to clean up right one one quote Say that again. I, what? I love that. Say that again. This is I don't know what I just said. Oh, this is living with the principles rather than using the principles to clean up your living. Is that what you just said? Something like that. Yeah. Um, that was channel, Leah. Good job. We've been talking about doing a session on channeling too, so um, we'll get to that. Uh, what I wanted to quote Johnny though, my my teacher, and uh, he said. The practice of yoga is so that we are no longer a prisoner to our pleasure or a slave to our pain. Yoga is the practice of being in your center. I love that quote. Johnny Cass? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a look at Aparigraha, non-possessiveness. Okay. Living to the material world, people, or things only weighs us down and makes life heavy. This tenet guides us to free ourselves from greed, grasping, and coveting. So that goes back to where Alexis quoted Lululemon <laughs> because I have everything I need with it. Um, but also, uh, I've never been one to hoard or collect or need things. I've never really needed that. I need uh, connections with people more than I do things. Um, but that feeling of purging or letting go of clutter Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever it be, whether it be um, belonging stuff or relationships um, that you try to keep really tight and control, not letting go of them, like being able to say, 
go on your way to everything in your life is so freeing and liberating. It gives you a sense of confidence. I should say you should say me. It gives me a sense of confidence so that I am safe and well and good in my own. And that all things that I need will come to me as I need them. And I can let go of them as they need to be released. Yeah. So this is where trust comes into the picture, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, this one really shows up in my training on the map. Because I feel it physically when I start to grasp, whether it's in a conversation or with it's something material. But when I'm on my mat in a regular practice, I've got the muscular memory of what it feels like when I'm holding on too tight. Mm. When I'm aiming, when I'm super focused on getting a pose versus just being in my practice mm. and balancing all of the elements. And then when I have that, that physical sensation that trigger come up of oh i'm holding on to this part of my practice i can start to better recognize it and connect the dots off the mountain in my life mm -hmm. and then i know let go, let go. yeah mm -hmm. i mean i remember having goal poses all the time i let go of that a few years ago and it's like really nice <laughs> it's like, it's like me less pressure <laughs> yes <clears throat> okay let's move on to the neon so the these are more of the personal practices, the personal observances, the do's. Okay, the first one is Saucha, cleanliness. Saucha calls us to cleanse and purify our bodies and our actions, attitudes, homes, and hearts. When we are free from impurities, we can live with more harmony, clarity, and energy. Let go of the foods, habits, and people that drain you and align with what feels good. Hmm. This is a, a daily practice. And so this is monitoring for me, monitoring my energy and knowing what's going to nourish me and what's going to create more toxicity for me. And that changes depending on what's going on with the seasons, what's going on in our collective consciousness, what's going on in my family, what's going on in my practice. So this is really looking to the foods, the relationships and the daily habits that we serve me, and my, my family and steering away on a, on a minute by minute basis almost of what will deplete my vital energy to keep it pure, keep it vital. Absolutely. I mean, this kind of goes hand in hand with Brahmacharya for me talking about keeping pure vital energy. Um, you know, another layer that I work on this is cord cutting. You have me do it with you all the time when I'm like talking about certain relationships in my life that may be either a little bit toxic or I'm codependent on it or I'm putting too much energy into it. It's like, okay, can you cut that energetic cord? Can you like literally clean up your energetic field, Shelby, so that you can have, you can burn off the impurities and you can fill back up with that white light that you know that radiates and permeates all of your space naturally. And um, keeping my energetic field clean is super important to me letting go of the things that aren't working for me, things that are bound to me, that I've chosen to bound, find myself to, and like purifying it. Yeah, amazing. So one really simple practice that you can do um, is take a salt bath at night, especially if you felt like there are, um, whether they're cords or relationships or your habits throughout the day have been a little bit toxic or heavy. Cleanse yourself before you go to sleep at night. Take a salt bath. Salt helps clear your energetic field. Being in the water element is grounding and also soft, right? So it allows you to unwind, invites you to unwind. So a salt bath at the end of the day, super great way to purify. Mm -hmm. okay. Salt lamps in your house to purify the air. Yes. Um, Alexis just wrote, maybe a parigraha too. If you hoard, is it clean? Is it pure or is it messy? Well, this is where it looks different for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, de it depends on your whole life and, and what is the mess? How did the mess get there, right? Or, or the hoarding or, or sometimes it's, it's gathering, right? Um, it's going to look different for each of us which this is why it's so important for all of us to be living these practices because the more that we are checking in, doing the self-inquiry and taking the action to be in charge of our own bodies and our own homes, our own side of the street, the more that we can show up 
with awareness and in, in, in service for everyone else. Yeah. Um, to add to that, you know, like talking about if you hoard, is it clean? Is it pure? Is it messy? Like all of this practice is getting down to the why of what you do, right? So we don't know necessarily why we do what we do all the time. But this roadmap, this eight limb path gives you access to the self-awareness so that you start to figure out the why behind it. So hoarding isn't terrible if you know what you're hoarding and why you're hoarding it, what the intention behind that collection is. Mm -hmm. And like Leah said, it's like different for every person. Um, you know, and but these practices help you get to that understanding and awareness of why you have it. And it's very mystical. It's not just like, it's not like, I'm gonna practice yamas and niyamas and I'm gonna figure out why I hoard. No, it just reveals itself to you mm -hmm. in a very light and beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Because what you focus on, you will expand your awareness. Mm -hmm. I know for me, when I first started practicing the yamas and niyamas, I was studying um, intensely with a Buddhist monk at the time. And for, it was less than a year, but it was an intense year. Um, I would carry around a little black book and then reflect every two hours on my practices of aligning with the yamas and niyamas. And uh, that led to a pretty limiting life for a while, but I got super focused on how I was wired up and it trained, I trained my body, mind, and heart to be looking for this yogic alignment off the mat. Yeah. Okay. I remember, I remember that story about you. Um, I just found the guy. Okay. Next we have Santosha contentment. Contentment is total acceptance of what is it is appreciating the moment santosha invites us to live in the now and be grateful for the everyday gifts that are all around us um santosha contentment okay so contentment the way that one of my teachers baron talks about it is being absorbed in the moment loving everything gratitude for now that's the way i would describe it but what he says is it's also this hunger for growth and continuing to have things be better and uplifted so that you are satisfied right now and there's some level of unsatisfaction to propel you moving forward so you recognize all the good now and the potential for what else it could be yeah for sure i love that um i like the propelling you for more growth aspect Honestly, I've never put that into my definition of Santosha. And if you remember the other day, I told you, I called you and I said, I'm practicing Santosha today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Contentment. I woke up discontent with literally everything I, about my day, myself, the world around me. I was complaining. I was negative. Um, lots of different, lots of different moments. And I was walking the trail. And I have to always remember coming back to the blue sky. Finding that gratitude just puts you in the seat of Santosha. Mm -hmm. So I was walking around the trail. Normally, if I go like a mile on the trail, I feel better. But this one took me four full miles before I looked up and actually saw the clouds and how beautiful they were. And then I had that moment of recognition. It reminded me of the Buddha blue sky, right? Mm -hmm. But I was like, oh, now that I, now that I can see the gratitude that I am in, now I feel content. And it took me, it took me the whole four mile loop mm -hmm. to get to that place, mm -hmm. which means I was really agitated, right? And then the sky opened up to me and then I let my eyes open up and see what was around me. And in that place, sit in the seat of gratitude and then peace prevailed. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, well now I need to keep moving my day in that direction. How can I stay in the seat of gratitude? Mm -hmm. So a simple way to stay in the seat of gratitude, especially when you're disrupted or your mind is turbulent, right? Is to ask, well, what am I grateful for? Yeah. What am I grateful for right now and come up with a list. Represent the light in your life. What is good? What is blessed? What is going right? Even when it seems like shit's in the fan. Right? Yeah. Look for the light. And that's what yoga practice is all about. It's looking for looking the possibilities. The yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep on going. Tapas, austerity. So 
So toughness is the heat that's required to change anything and grow. It's the self-discipline of a developing a new routine. It's the commitment of a long-term relationship or the self-control of staying in a challenging yoga pose when your muscles are burning and sweat is running down your face. Tapas asks us to trust the process, especially when the heat gets turned up. Heat is required for transformation. We know this from our physical practice. When we are in a disciplined and committed physical practice, we have the muscle mem memory, the cellular information to be able to stay when we are in, in challenging positions, conversations, political climate, all of this that we're dealing with right now, global pandemic, we can stay, be connected to our center, our heart centers, and take action in a way that is of service of ourselves, our families, and our communities versus freaking out because there's a lot of heat right now. Yeah. I'm a little speechless right now. Ask, either ask me a question or tell me more because you just kind of, I just kind of got choked up. Well, I would, I would say, join us on, the, join us on the mat. And this is what we put into action every time we step into our classes, especially at Be Free. So join us on the mat and you will get this taste of tapas. It really comes in modern yoga. It comes through a deeply physical practice, which is the third limb, which we're almost there, asana. Um, so let's move on to spadaya, self-study. This is the pursuit and daily practice of knowing yourself. If we don't take the time to look within and reflect, we can easily cruise through life on autopilot. Study what drives you, what shaped you, and how you can be your best now. All of these are working with each other, by the way. Like they're just adding to each other. Each one is necessary for the next one. Um, and the self-study practice, right? So we know that it's the journey to the self through the self, right? Small self, big self. Mm -hmm. And as you put yourself through these practices, keeping these tenets of your practice at the forefront of your day, on the mat, off the mat, that is a series of collection of data. With that data, you then get to see yourself more clearly. And it's, when you look at it as the idea of collecting data, it makes it not personal, right? It's no, like, even if you get caught up in the story of whatever, like I was talking about my insecurities or my negative self-talk or shame spirals or being whatever, like all of that can still be occurring while you're focusing on these promises that you've made yourself, these tenets of your practice, and with that, they go hand in hand, all of a sudden you start to reveal that you are whole, you have an ego, you have a spirit, they're working together, and you can see them for what they are. Mm -hmm. And that is personal awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're seeking, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I like to think of this one, too, as um, looking for the wisdom in my falls, right? In my falls? In my falls, like wh where I fall. So having the courage to look at some of the parts of my life um, as, a, as a grown woman, um, especially those parts um, in my own evolution where when I look back, I'm like, oh, oh. yeah. I did, I did that. that. <laughs> did we just face each other? <laughs> and trust that there's a there's a wisdom nugget in there. Right? So how can I look back, own everything that I've, I've done and learn from it, learn from it and continue to learn from daily interactions always. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at Ishvara Pranidhana. This is devotion. So devotion is recognizing that we're all in this together and honoring that everything is connected. It's also a trust that something greater is at work. So you can trust that the universe has your back and that you are both protected and guided. All you need to do is trust and lean into it. I get real hippy dippy in that one, but like this is, this is the yoga. This is why we do yoga because we don't need to recreate the wheel. There is a pathway laid out before us. It is the eight limb path that yeah. we can follow and apply to our own lives that leads us directly to more health and happiness, more understanding, more compassion. And when we expand our own self-awareness and when we recognize that God is within us, God is all around us, we, are, we 
take actions and we look for and uplift the greater good. Yeah. It's like um, in this, in this Niyama, um, surrender feels so good to me. It doesn't have a bad connotation to it. It's like I can let go and settle into the goodness that exists and permeates this whole universe and that I know that it's in a state of flow, right? That, that comes back to the trust piece. Yeah. That comes back to letting go. Um, and also, like you said, like not having to recreate the wheel. Like this has been tested for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's pretty flawless. And when you can get through all the yamas and niyamas and then just say, I offer it up now, it's relieving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the yamas and niyamas. Those are the first two limbs. Very quickly, we're going to brush over the other limbs and uh, give some context and then invite you all to put them into practice today. Yeah. Right, so the third limb is asana. Asana practice, most of us are really familiar with that in modern yoga. So that's getting onto your mat, doing the sacred postures and the sacred sequences to expand your vitality. Then the fourth limb is pranayama. Prana is vital life force energy. Yama, as we learned, is control. So pranayama is um, energy control and it's breathing techniques. Breath is how we control our energy. And in the Empowered program, we're going to be going over quite a few breath techniques. Um, it is a level, well, I, I think of it as a level beyond the asanas, right? When you start to pay attention to your pranic body or your subtle body, your energy body, that is a much deeper level of yoga and personal experience in the world. What do you think, Shel? It unlocks your body's potential. It's necessary. We need it. More pranayama, please. I also really love when, when I started pranayama practice, I'll be like, nothing's working, nothing's working. Because I couldn't, I did not have the capacity to control my breath. I, that's a muscle you have, to, you have to work out, right? The diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and so for a long time, I was like, this isn't working, this isn't working, or this is hard. And then when my breath really came to life, mm -hmm. pure potential. Like, it's amazing. Breath mm -hmm. is everything. It's yeah. literally why we're sitting here. It, it gives life, for sure. Then we've got the four levels of meditation. So first one, Pratyahara. Pratyahara is the withdrawal of the external senses so that you can awaken your inner wisdom, your inner vision, your insight. We are constantly stimulated in modern life, especially when we're in smaller spaces now, like our homes all day long. We are seeing the same things again and again, but we have a lot of things plugged in. I know I've got my computer and my phone, my iPad, and there are a bunch of other devices in our, our home too. So taking the time to shut everything down, tune out the chatter so that you can tune in and awaken your inner wisdom, that is, that is yoga, right? Right. Um, do you want to talk about the other three really quickly? About what? Do you want to talk about the other three? Yeah, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Dharana, uh, Dhyana, and Samadhi are generally uh, seen together as a collective three. And they're the three stages that get you through to Ananda, bliss, to oneness, absorption with divine. Um, so after you have Pratyahara, when you start to, I like to use the word attune the senses, whether it's your inner wisdom or if you're working with vision or hearing or whatever the senses you're working with, to attune and heighten that one, inner wisdom being the deepest. So uh, Dharana, concentration, is taking that sense attunement and then you have a razor focused energy um, concentration on whatever that focal is for you in that moment, whether it is your inner landscape, maybe it is a drishti, a point, a flame, whatever, but you've now distilled your awareness and your presence to the concentration point of dark. And I, the way that I think of that is putting your attention on something. Putting, like, placing your attention on. Mm -hmm. Uh, dhyana meditation is starting to get absorbed into that thing. 
I give um, an analogy, a visualization in um, our 200 hour training when I talk about this, uh, talking about a dripping sink. So let's say, take the visual that you are in the bathroom and you turn the faucet on just as a drip, 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 drip. So Darana is placing your attention on the drip Diana is when you keep the faucet exactly as it is, the drip doesn't change, but you've become slightly absorbed into it where the drip starts to feel slower and more connected. It's no longer drip, drip, drip. It's like drip. And then samadhi is when the drip goes away completely and you're still focused on it, but you're absorbed in it and there's no longer spaces in between. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Very basic. And samadhi is, as you said, ananda, bliss. It's when you are connected with the cosmos. There's no longer separate. Yes, yes. Nothing is other. This is the recognition of yoga, that we are all connected. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, well, this was just an hour conversation on the yams and niyamas. And if you guys have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat right now. Let's see. Um, my name's Leah, and uh, <laughs> um, bring back the checklist. <laughs> checklist. Oh, it's kind of intense. Um, can it be described of the absence of pain? I think that came up during Pratyahara. I wouldn't describe it of the absence of pain, not at all. Yeah, I, w I would say it's being with your pain. Mm -hmm. Like, you know. Yeah, being with your pain. It's not the absence. There's no denial of it. It's complete acceptance of everything that there is. Mm -hmm. So there's no renunciation, there's absorption, acceptance, oneness. Love, loving it. Love. Yeah, fully embracing it. Yes. Thank you. What Christine. is the checklist, Jessica? Oh, you mean my book? Bring back the checklist. I think she was talking about writing it down. That that was, um, yeah. That oh, was my reference. My, my book practice, um, it was a, every other hour. Oh, check the little book. Yeah. That, you know, that was pretty intense. That's when I was, um, I mean, I was going to bed at 9 p.m. I, mean, I was living a very, very limited life because I was so dedicated to my practice. And, and this is part of the evolution of, of yoga. But there were times when Shelby and I both have completely pulled out of the world so we can be fully immersed in our practice. Um, and that sort of hyper focus on my Buddhist studies for a time in my life has really served me and I'm glad that I've done it. However, it, it doesn't fit so much for modern life today, which is one of the most beautiful parts of this practice is that we get to try things on and then we can keep what is of greatest service now and we can let go of what doesn't really fit for our life in our own circumstances. Yeah. Um, I will say about the checking in and about also living in a modern life, I got off of antidepressants three years ago and I've been keeping a daily journal every day since then. Mm -hmm. um, and I do it on the four aspects of being, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I give myself seasons to go back and reflect on what they are so I can find patterns and rhythm. Yep. And so one thing is, is that I am completely dedicated to that inquiry process daily, but I'm not obsessive about it. I let life have its full flow and season. And then I go back and reflect mm -hmm. and it is just so eye opening. And you know, and that puts me back on track for a new way for a little while. And then I slip back into another way. But, um, so it's, it's consistent and it's daily because that's what we're committed to, uh, but it's not obsessive. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be, um, be too much, but you can still be, it can still be a practice that you do. Yes. And I, like you, I'm doing my journaling every day. I've got my daily practices, but they're adapted now to meet where I am in life. Yeah. And that is the essence I'll say for the empowered program. We are wanting to share modern tools, modern yogic tools for time today. They're timeless methods uh, or timeless teachings and modern methods. And with that, we also do that reflection process that you were just talking about, Shelby. 
Um, we do that after every class. So part of the post-class reflection is looking at, well, I just had this experience. So what opened up for me physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? And when you get into that rhythm, that self-study after your asana practice, it starts to open up and reveal all of these insights in, in, from your inner wisdom, from your personal experience. And looking at yourself with those four awareness perspectives, it starts to not be just after practice or on the mat. I mean, it starts to happen everywhere. And then that helps you fine tune what you are allowing into your life and into your energetic field and what you are taking out of it, right? So this is as, as deep and complex as this study is. It's also very simple and direct and potent. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then that is what reveals everything to you. You're just like, it's like magical, right? You're like, wow, there's so much to see and yet I get it so well. Mm -hmm. And that check-in process after class connects the physical to the, to the four quadrants, right? Emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical all together. And when you have that on the mat, when you have that after practice, you can start to work it all through life. Yeah. So the empowered training, it starts October 19th. It is eight weeks of study. It's half live, half reported content. We know that we are all craving deep connections and we are missing being in the studios. So with the Be Free Digital Studio, we've got three live classes every week. Two practices with me, um, Mondays and Fridays at noon, and Shelby, her advanced asana, Saturdays at 10 a.m. Then we have two live sessions, one with me, one with Shelby every week, where we will go deeper into all of the course content and we, you have time to ask your questions and we'll do some live coaching there too. Additionally, you have over 70 videos of recorded workshop and specialty content. Shelby's leading 10 hours of anatomy. We go into Ayurveda, more sister science practices, other lifestyle practices, the chakras, breaking down um, some sequencing. All of this is designed to deepen your personal practice and give you practical tools for both asana and everyday life. So we will send the link out to learn more and register. And in fact, I'll put it in the um, chat right now, but we'll send it out in our follow-up email. Shelby, is there anything else you'd like to say? When's our next webinar? Oh. Don't, don't we have another one? Yeah, you know what? We have one next week and we're going to do a Q&A. But um, if you guys have any additional questions that you want us to address on our, next, our webinar next week, we will do that. So send us yeah. a note. Um, check us out on Instagram and uh, we, we'll be checking our DMs there. All panelists and attendees. Okay, I'm putting in the empowered link right now. All right. Well, thank you, Jess. Aw, thanks, Jess. It's Leah Cullis, at Leah Cullis is her handle, and mine is at Shelby Blooms. There might be an underscore in there. Um, we both have yoga pictures up. Yes. Um, I'm so glad everyone came. Thank you so much. Blooms with an L, like blooming flower. Shelby Blooms. Why don't you write it? In? I don't know what it is. But that says Booms. And that's not wrong either. <laughs> New handle. I love you guys so much. You just made our whole eight month global pandemic feel so much better, right? This is so fun, even though we're just talking about chat and hanging out. Um, we've missed you and uh, we're here for you. Thanks for being here for us. Thank you, everyone. We'll be in touch soon. Yeah, Namaste. I'll see you later. <laughs> Namaste, Yogi. Thanks, Leah. Thank you.